عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومواله اللهم لا سهلا إلا ما جعل أبو سهلا وأنت يا حي يا قيوم تجعل الحزن إلى شئت سهلا سهلا رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحم العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless this gathering. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept this work from the organizers. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless everyone who worked behind the scenes to put this conference together. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them and their families in this life and the next. Ameen. Ya Rabbil Alameen. This whole conference is around the topic of legacy leaving behind a legacy, living a life where we don't just live and die and are forgotten, but we make a difference in the world, that we leave behind a mark, that we bring benefit to society. This whole conference revolves around this topic of legacy. But what I'm supposed to talk about is for us to take a step back, to take a step back and realize that there is something essential that comes before we can even talk about legacy building. We were not created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to leave behind a legacy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us very clearly in the Quran why he created us. He says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That I have only created the jinn and the human beings to worship me. So that is the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. Our goal in life, first and foremost, is to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when we engage in da'wah, when we engage in Islamic activism, when we engage in Islamic work, what are we doing? We are doing, what we are doing is, we are calling people to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what we're doing. We're trying to call people to Allah. We're trying to connect people to Allah. That is the ultimate goal of any legacy that we're trying to be, leave behind. That we leave a mark in people's lives such that they are connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by our efforts. So, da'wah, calling people to Allah's worship is actually a means, not the goal in and of itself. Legacy building is a means, not a goal in and of itself. The goal is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we, can, if we can appreciate that, then we have to ask ourselves a very important question. And that is, how then can Islamic work, legacy building, da'wah work, how can it come at the cost of worship? How is it, why is it that a lot of times our activism, our involvement, our da'wa work, our relief work, our legacy building comes at the cost of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That means that we have flipped the priorities we have missed the plot. If we look at Rasulullah who left behind such a great legacy, how did it all begin with him? One of the first revelations that were given to him, Ya ayyuhal zabmi qumi layla illa qalila nisfahu awin qusmi qalila 
أوزد عليه ورتل القرآن ترتيلا أو يوب هو is wrapped up قوم الليل get up and perform قيام الليل get up and worship your Lord Allah did not say get up and start working for a legacy get up and start calling people to Allah he didn't say that at the beginning. At the beginning, he said, Get up and worship your Lord. Get up and worship your Lord throughout the entire night, except for a small portion of the night. Half the night, or a little less, or a little more, and recite the Quran with beautiful recitation and proper tajweed. That's the first command from Allah Azza wa Jal. And then comes, Ya ayyuhal muddathir, O you who is wrapped up, Qum fa'andhir. Get up, and now you start warning people. وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ وَثِيَابَكَ فَطَهِرْ وَالرُّجِزَ فَهْجُرْ Until the end of the ayat. So what we see from the life of the Prophet Sallallahu himself is how the process works. It's a sequential process. And if we jump in the process, well, there are consequences of that that I will talk about in just a few minutes. But before I do that, I also want to establish something else that's related to this. And that is, dear brothers and sisters, that Islamic work Legacy work, da'wah work, al-amru bil ma'roof wa nayyu anil munkar. This is fard kifaya in our deen. It is a communal obligation in our deen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلْتَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْ مَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ Let there be a group from amongst you who call people to good, who enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong. Let there be a group from amongst you. Allah did not say that this is an obligation on every single Muslim. And from that, the majority of the ulama agree that al-amru bil ma'roof wa nahyu anil munkar or translated as Islamic activism, da'wah work, whatever you want to call it, right? Islamic work, this is falkifaya. It's a communal obligation. Whereas working on my heart, developing a relationship between me and Allah Azza wa Jal is fardain. Is fardain. It is an individual obligation on every legally responsible Muslim man and woman. How can we give priority to fard kifaya over fardain? A communal obligation cannot be given priority over an individual obligation. And the greatest example of that is in this masjid right here. How frequently is Salat al-Janazah performed? It is always performed after Dhuhr, not before Dhuhr. Why is that? Why do we pray Dhuhr first even though the Janazah is ready? Because Dhuhr is Fard Ayn, whereas Janazah is Fard Kifaya. So in our deen, we give priority. We have to give priority to that which is more important. And working on the condition of my heart, developing a relationship with my Lord, cleansing my heart, purifying my heart, tazkiyatun nafs, striving to achieve a sound heart, this is all fardain. This is all individual obligation. And therefore, it cannot come, uh, it cannot be put at a lower level than Islamic work and da'wah work. Imam al-Ghazali years ago, he spoke about this in his book, and he said the analogy of a person who is so concerned about the well-being of others day and night you know, having meetings, organizing events. 
trying to bring khair to people, trying to save people from the hellfire. But he neglects his own self. He's sleeping through Fajr, staying up late, texting so that the conference can be organized properly, but sleeps through Fajr. Neglects his own fardain, neglects his own relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because he's so concerned about bringing others to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said the analogy of such a person is like a man who is sitting next to another man. And this man, his, his friend who's sitting next to him, he has flies flying around his head. And he's busy shooing away the flies from the face of his friend while his own clothes are infested with scorpions. But he neglects the scorpions inside of his thobe because he's too busy shooing away the flies from the face of his friend. That is essentially what we are doing when we are neglecting the condition of our heart because of the excuse of al-amru bil ma'roof wa nahyu anil munkar because I have to work to improve and better this society. Whenever any of us travels in an airplane, right? And the flight attendants, they give that talk at the beginning. What do they always say? In the case where there's a lack of oxygen in the cabin, these masks are going to fall down. And what are you supposed to do, they say? Put your own mask before helping others. Put your own mask before helping others. Why do they say that? Because I cannot help somebody else if I, myself, dead. If my heart is dead, how can I bring life to somebody else's heart? If I am not with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how can I call others there? Imagine, you're telling everybody to go to a party, to go to a party, to go to a party, but you're not at the party yourself. Why would anybody want to go? If we want people to come somewhere, we should be there first. We have to be there first. And that's the whole point of this talk that I'm supposed to be talking about. Tazkiyah, my dear brothers and sisters, is especially important for those who are involved in building a legacy. Those that are involved in Islamic work. Those that are involved in activism. If you look at the life of the Prophet وسلم, his mission that he was sent with is described in the Quran in multiple places. How does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describe his mission? He says in one place, that he is the one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who sent among an unlettered people a messenger from amongst themselves to do what? With what mission? Number one, ayatihi to recite unto them his ayat, to recite the Quran to them. That's mission number one. Mission number two is what? وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ To do tazkiyah of these people. To cleanse these people. وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ And mission number three and four, to teach people the book and the wisdom, the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Part of the mission with which Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sent. The prophetic mission includes Tazkiyah of people. And Tazkiyah, dear brothers and sisters, is necessary if we want our da'wah to bring fruit. If we want our efforts to bring fruit, Tazkiyah is necessary. Why? Because what is Tazkiyah? I'll talk about it a little bit more in a, in, a, in a couple of minutes, but for now, tazkiyah is refining the heart. 
It's removing the ugliness from my heart and acquiring beauty, inner beauty, right? So if I don't have tazkiyah, then my akhlaq would be ugly. The way that I interact with people is going to be ugly because I am not doing any tazkiyah. Because my character is simply a manifestation of the condition of my heart. If I am an arrogant person inside, well, that's going to show in the way that I talk to you. That's going to show in the way that I deal with you. If I'm an impatient person inside, that's going to show in the way that I carry myself. And if I'm a humble person, that's also going to show in the way that I talk. So my akhlaq is simply a ref reflection of the condition of my heart. And if I'm not working to cleanse my heart, that's going to have an impact on my character. And if my character is ugly, then how will I be successful in my da'wah? Why would anybody want to listen to me? Why would anybody want to listen to me if I am a person of bad afraq? When I don't work on the tazkiyah of my nafs and my heart, it leads to what? It leads to the abuse of the tongue. It leads to rage. It leads to boastfulness. It leads to lack of haya. And all of these things become impediments in the success of our da'wah work. That is why tazkiyah is especially important for those who are involved in the work of da'wah in the field of Islamic work. It is necessary for fruitful da'wah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us in the Quran in more than one place from telling people to do good but forgetting our own selves. Trying to spread goodness in society, right? Getting involved in all of these organizations, all of this work, trying to do all of this good community service and, and, and community building and all this activism, but forgetting our own selves. Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, do you command people to do righteousness? You forget your own selves. And you recite the book of Allah. Don't you have reason, don't you think? Ya ayyuhal ladhina amu, lima taquluna ma la tafa'anu? Kabura maqtan inda Allahi an taquluna ma la tafa'anu? Oh, you who have faith. Why is it that you say that which you don't do? Why is it that you preach something that you don't practice? Kabura maqtan, it is a grave thing in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal that you say that which you do not do. Now, what happens a lot of times is the shaitan comes and deceives us. He will keep us focused on the work. Focused on the work. Improving this institution that I'm building to bring khair into the community. I have to work on the design, I have to work on the theme, I have to work on the marketing, I have to uh, develop a strong program, I have, to, I have to improve the programming, all of this, and makes us more and more busy with the work. And what he does is he makes us lose sight of our own condition in the process. So shaitan will not come and tell you to do something haram. No, he's coming to you and he's telling you to do something good. It's good. It's for kifaya. But at the expense of what? At the expense of that which is more important. And in fact, essential for you to achieve this good that he is getting you busy with. This is the deception of shaitan. And the consequence of falling for this deception is what? We lose 
If not in this life, then in the next life. And our da'wah loses. Our work loses. We are unable to be as successful as we could have been if we had turned our attention to our hearts as we do that work. Now, the last 10 minutes that I have, I want to zoom in on what is tazkiyah, this word tazkiyah, tazkiyah that we always mention. What is this anyway? Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talk about this in the Quran? Of course, we just mentioned one ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said it was part of the mission of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In another place, in a surah that most of you have memorized, a surah that contains the largest number of consecutive oaths taken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Eleven solemn oaths. وَالشَّمْسِ وَضُحَاهَا وَالْقَمَرِ إِذَا تَلَاهَا وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا جَلَّاهَا وَالْلَيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَاهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes one oath after another oath, after another oath, after another oath, building it up, building it up, building it up. After the eleventh oath, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا Truly successful is he or she who does tazkiyah of his or her nafs, who cleanses their soul. And truly, the person who does not do that is a loser. But the ayah prior to this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed this nafs inside of us and it has instilled in this nafs a tendency to do evil and a tendency to do good. Every one of us is created with this nafs. And this nafs has the propensity to do evil and it has a propensity to do good. But the propensity to do evil is also talked about in other places in the Quran. For example, Surah Yusuf. Yusuf alayhi salam says, Indeed, this nafs, this lower nafs that Allah Azza wa Jalla has placed inside of us, it commands you to do evil. Repeatedly, constantly, la amara, not amira, la amara tum bisu, constantly urging you to do evil, to do wrong, to do things that are ugly. Imam al Ghazali, rahimahullah ta'ala, he expounds on this in his book, Kimya Sa'ad, The Alchemy of Happiness. And he says that this nafs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us with. It has different tendencies. And the evil tendencies are of three types. There are three types of evil tendencies that our nafs has. And he calls it a nafsu bahiniya and a nafsu sabuiya and a nafsu shaytaniya. He says there is an aspect of our nafs that is like cattle, like cattle, like cows. Why? Because what does a cow do all day long? Eats, drinks, sleeps, plays, and multiplies. All day long, you drive countryside, driving from Dallas to Houston, pass by these cows, what are they doing? They're either eating, or drinking, or sleeping, or playing, or multiplying. That's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a cow. There's a tendency in our nafs to always want to do that and find clever ways to do that and to enhance the quality of all of those things. Better food, better drink, better games, better ways of sleeping and more enjoyable forms of multiplication. I'm just trying to be euphemistic here, get my drift. That's an aspect of our nafs. 
And then there's another aspect of our nafs, he says, that is a nafs al-sabu'iyya, the predatory nafs. There's a nafs inside of us that urges us to do the types of things that a predator does, like a hyena. Destroy, fight. There's a tendency inside of us, inside of our nafs. And then there's another tendency that he calls a nafs al-shaytaniyya, the demonic nafs, that urges us to do things that are demonic, that are shaytani, shaytan-like. Conspiracy, plotting, demeaning, deception, and so on and so forth. And these tendencies are there inside of our nafs. And what did Allah Azza wa Jal says? Allah has placed these tendencies inside of our af, inside of our nafs. But you will only be successful if you work to discipline and cleanse this nafs. That you gain control of this nafs. Because if we don't, if we don't, then this nafs will take over the qalb, will take over the heart. And when it takes over the heart, the heart becomes blind. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about that as well in the Qur'an. إِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَ absar. It is not their eyesight that go blind, but the hearts that are inside of their chests that go blind. And what happens when our hearts are blind? We will mistake truth for falsehood. We will mistake right from wrong, right for wrong. And when we are trying to do da'wah work, it is so important it is so important to distinguish right from wrong because we have to make so many decisions, difficult decisions about what we can do and what we cannot do, who we can ally with and who we can't ally with, for example. But if our hearts are veiled by our nafus, then we will make blunders. We will make compromises that we cannot and we will refuse to compromise on issues where we should. Because it's all upside down, because the heart is sick, because the heart is veiled, because the heart is blinded by that nafs that I have allowed to become inflated because I refuse to work on the tazkiyah of my nafs because I am so busy building a legacy. Because I am so busy trying to work for the betterment of people. But how is that betterment going to come when I did not قُمِ اللَّيْلَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا when I did not fulfill the prerequisite that Rasulullah started with, our Sahaba left behind great legacy. They conquered lands. They expanded Islam to the corners of the world within a matter of few years. But before that legacy came, what happened in 13 years of Mecca? Any jihad? No jihad. All Iman. All aqidah, all akhlaq, all developing a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That has to come first. That has to be given priority. Only then will our da'wah efforts bring fruit, my dear brothers and sisters. So how can I start this process of tazkiyah? And I'll conclude with this in the two minutes that I have. Two things. One hadith of Rasulullah and one statement of the Salaf. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, My servant does not draw near to me by doing anything that is more beloved to me than those things that I have made obligatory upon him or her. And he will continue to draw closer to me by acts that are nawafil, that are extra until I become the hearing with which he hears and the sight with which he sees and so on and so forth. So Allah has laid out the chart for us. You want to get close to Allah? You want to develop that relationship and strengthen that relationship and achieve that sound heart so that your da'wah can be successful? This is the path. Start with perfecting your obligations. Make sure that you are praying your five daily salawat on time. Start there. 
Make sure that you are telling the truth. Start there. Make sure that you are respectful of your parents. Start there. These are obligations. We have to be striving to perfect these obligations if we are serious about achieving a sound heart. And once, alhamdulillah, we have perfected these obligations, then we add extra. The awrad, the adhkar, the nawafil, the recitation of the Qur'an, extra dua, extra charity, and so on and so forth. This is the path according to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the last thing is a statement of Ibrahim al-Khawas, rahimahullahu ta'ala. A great sagacious early Muslim ascetic and scholar. He said that the heart is cured by five things. The heart is cured by five things. If you want to bring a cure to your heart, do these five things regularly. The more you do it, the more cure your heart will attain. What are these five things? Number one, Qiyamul Layl. Number two, night vigil, night prayers. Number two, reciting the Quran with tadabbur, with reflection, with contemplation, having study circles where we come together and understand the Quran and reflect on the meaning of the Quran. Number three, maintaining an empty stomach. Eat less, control your diet for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. Fast more and fast properly. Number four, company of the righteous. Suhbat al-Salihin. Be, be careful who you befriend. Choose your friends wisely and spend time with those that are righteous. And number five, imploring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before the break of dawn. Get up a few minutes before Fajr. If you have gone to sleep after Qiyamul Layl, otherwise, after Qiyamul Layl, just spend a few moments imploring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, raise your hands and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you. My dear brothers and sisters, tazkiyah is not a noun. It's a verbal noun. It's an active noun. It's a masdar. Purification is a noun. Tazkiyah is a masdar. It's an active noun. Which means that it is something that we do on a daily basis. It's not something that we attain and we move on. Tazkiya is a lifelong endeavor, just like physical exercise. If you want to be in good shape, you have to keep exercise every week, every other day, every day. When you stop, you start seeing the changes in yourself. So Tazkiya is something that doesn't stop, that continues in a consistent struggle to better our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us sound hearts. Allahumma ati nufusana taqwaha wa zakkiha anta khayru man zakkaha anta waliyuha maulaha ya muqallib al-quloob thabbit quloobana ala deenik ya musarrif al-quloob sarrif quloobana fi ta'atik ya Allah grant us hearts that are sound and grant us tongues that are truthful. Ya Allah, give us the company of the righteous in this world and the company of the righteous in the next world. Ya Rabbil Alameen, help us live lives of worship and lives where we call others to your worship. Ameen Ya Rabbil Alameen, Jazakumullah Khairan. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.